Well, first of all, distinguished guests, I am at a loss for words. Usually I speak with my brush or my chisel. Uh, after such an introduction, it's very difficult to humble oneself to a status of normality. So in case I sleep on any uh, uncivilized words, you will forgive me for it. But I want to be in front of you as natural as possible and just give you a light what it means to be an Ethiopian artist, an African artist, who has passed and has been lucky enough to experience all the great teaching places, including uh, museums where you see world masterpieces like Mona Lisa by Da Vinci in France and uh, the Last Judgment of Michelangelo in St. Peter's in Rome, and some of the magnificent works of Francesco de Goya of Spain. Having passed through all this, thanks to a scholarship known as uh, the Prix de Rome, it was the last important scholarship I won in England at the Slade, which is part of the University of London, that gave you a chance to travel after your studies for three to six months in France, in Germany, in Italy, in Spain, and Portugal. So I benefited by all these experiences, feeling so ambitious to go back to my country, begin a school of thought, a school of creativity, where lucky enough to have been born from Ethiopia, which is next to Egypt, almost 5,000 years of existence and contributing to the world with her heritage, to suddenly appear in that scene and say to yourself, with all the advantage of learning with all the advantage of the great professors that I have had, that now, what am I going to contribute? Am I going to become just a typical local artist copying what the Europeans at that time, tourists required, a copy of the old works? Or am I going to create something based on my own tradition, on African tradition, and also on world art heritage tradition. These were the big questions that confronted me when I reached my homeland. I could have, of course, with the advice of many students that I have been with, they say, what are you going to do in Africa? It is such a dark continent. They have no time for art. Their life is very difficult. Their ordinary existence is very difficult. Why don't you stay in Paris? Why don't you stay in London? Why don't you go to New York, where you will be able to create peacefully, tranquil, tranquilly, instead of thinking of your everyday life? Who is going to appreciate your art? They have their own daily problems. A young man, talented as you are, having had the benefit of knowledge and education, why don't you benefit? After all, Picasso, in the revolution time, he came to France and called it home. Marc Chagall from Russia, he called it home. Diego Rivera of Mexico called it home. So, you can stay in Paris, enjoy the life, enjoy all the benefits of civilization as a cultured man, as an artist, and yet, tomorrow, if you create something great, they said that you will always give to your continent and to your country a name, because people would refer to you afterwards, from Ethiopia, from Africa. They said you have paid for your debts, but this never happened. This is why 
I will try to find some words to put you in my position, how I felt. The choice was very, very, very difficult. But I had to decide because Ethiopia and Ethiopians, it is not like today, they never wanted to travel into any other land. They never wanted to conquer other places. But their integrity and their pride, if anybody dare touch it, they will not be sleeping with their spears and shields while somebody else took their country and their possession and their history. They fought for it. This only happened once in the history of Ethiopia. That was fascist Italy who dared, wanted to colonize Ethiopia, changed her history. It was at that time unknown to many. A sense of heroism was created, patriotism was created, and thanks to these people, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, Ethiopia was never conquered. The Italians ruled only the cities, not the countryside. Our patriots resisted to a point of their death or liberty. And so I felt I had that drop, a drop of that blood. What am I going to contribute to that land in Africa? And that's why I stayed, went back to Ethiopia. It was a wonderful time because we had an emperor who had a certain sense of clairvoyance and appreciated beautiful things. And for the first time, he opened my exhibition and I said, as was traditional in Ethiopia, you never sold a picture. You gave to someone and that somebody gave you money or a bullock or land. But it was considered a kind of shamefulness to say, you pay me for my painting or for my sculpture. Those who served our church, the Coptic church, they stayed in the grave house, most of them, but they created for the church, they created for God. That was their form of payment. They also never signed their paintings because that was also considered a personal glorification. I don't know if you can hear didn't touch anything. Um, so, I was coming in, into this place. At that time in Ethiopia, unless you were appointed, or you were a prince, or you were appointed to a position of a minister, etc., etc., you were practically nothing. And for art, for an artist, well, that was a secondary thing. So I said to myself, I have got all the greatest teachers in my own country, in Europe. I have benefited by that. If I cannot face this situation and make it my second point, not only to create, but to restore the dignity of the artist, the dignity of art, that Europe is firing. <laughs> you had sales, you had uh, uh, prices were going up. How am I going to change that to make it worthwhile for those painters who are coming after me so that they don't face these problems that I am facing today? I said, okay. So many hours for creation, so many hours for fighting, to restore the position of art and artists. And then the third point that 
sooner or later I will have to start teaching at the university about art, art history, aesthetic theory, and so forth and so on. But the struggle was very difficult. Unless you were appointed to a position, you never got money, you never got uh, recognition as an honorable person. So I said, I have to exhibit, not in my own capital city, not in the provinces, but I have to exhibit in Africa, in Europe, and America, all over the world. If I am to build my name, then people can, uh, leaders can uh, listen to me, including, of course, our great emperor. But I was lucky. I was so young, he was so old. At the same time, when I was putting certain struggles, he would say, what is it that makes this little boy tick? And secondly, which was so important, when we left on that rare scholarship from Ethiopia to study abroad in America, in England, in Beirut, when we won that scholarship, every young student was brought to the face of the emperor, and the emperor gave advice. And this advice was, you are now going to a country where you are going to, at your disposal, all kinds of learning. He said, study, study, you must study. And when you come back, he said, don't tell us what tall buildings you saw. Don't tell us what wide streets you saw. Come back and help us in the subject that you have studied when we are trying to build this country, which was completely destroyed by fascist Italy. That was the piece of advice I happened to have heard at the age of 16. And then I was in total nine years abroad. And I always said I could stay in Paris, I could stay in London, I could go to America, but those words, they rang like the bells of a big church in my ears. Am I, at the age of 28, going to desert my country because she's so poor? Because she is not recognizing the value of art. Everything was economical. Everything was to make money. Appointment was essential to get another appointment. I said, I have learned from my great fathers that even if the circumstances are absolutely impossible, you either die or you live in peace by struggling for this worthy cause. So, excuse me, so, I said, I will try it for one year. And in my first exhibition, where all the dignitaries were invited, where everybody thought, this young artist, what is it all about him? And the emperor was opening my exhibition. And the minister of education at that time, there was no minister of culture. He said to me, I have to give a painting to the emperor and make this speech. It was a written speech. When I read it, for me, it was a disaster. It meant nothing. It was as soft as the softest seed you can imagine. I was ready for the battle to, to bring out the great cultural heritage which Ethiopia possessed in modern terms. So I said, okay, to the Minister of Culture, I put his speech in my, my one pocket and I had my own speech on the other. The essential part of that speech was it addressed your imperial majesty, your highnesses, this and that. And then I forgot the papers and I said, today 
is a big day for me because I am going to begin the education that art has got to be bought. Artist has got to live with what he has earned from his paintings, from his works. Therefore, among all you dignities, I am not going to offer you any of my work. You have to buy. This was in front of the emperor. It was a big risk. But thank God, the emperor was gentle, uh, was gentle, and uh, um, and I said, you have to buy. Then, as we moved around, the emperor was graceful enough to say, I want this. It was a portrait of a priest blessing, which has nothing to do with the royal family. I said, success number one. Number two, he chose a painting of a peasant woman carrying wood on her back. I was thrilled inside. And then all the dignitaries, nine of them, no, uh, seven of them bought my paintings. They went home. And after two weeks, I was supposed to come back to Europe for my pre de Rome scholarship, the one I mentioned earlier. So the risk was very little. However, the emperor, the next day, I was staying in a hotel called Itagi Hotel, with the money in cash sent by one of the officers of the palace, the emperor paid I remember 900 bur, which is uh, really less than 100 dollars, as it were. But the others and his, uh, gra his son, uh, Duke of Harar, he bought another, it was a small drawing, for 250 uh, bur. Anyhow, all the others took the painting they said nothing. They would invite me to their place. I would have lunch or whatever it is. And then when I leave, I was expecting a check. But no check. <laughs> you can imagine if you put yourself in my position. So I left gracefully in everything because these are the big shots of our country. And then I tried to make an appointment, including the crown prince who had bought one of my works. I would go there, I would be invited to lunch, and then when I leave, there is no check. So in the end, the time for me to leave came, after two weeks. So I went to say goodbye to the emperor. And then the first thing he asked me, who paid you? Well, I said, your majesty and your son. No one else. He picked up the phone. He called, the, I think it was the crown prince, and said, either the money or the painting should be delivered to his hotel. And he told me, you will not live now. You have time for a week or so. And he said, you live, we'll see to it. You wouldn't believe it. On that day, before six o'clock, the remaining seven paintings were delivered in my hotel. <laughs> that was a big lesson for me, to make my decision whether to live in Paris or London or to take the risk, make as many exhibitions abroad. If I exhibit 50 works and I sell 10, life is very cheap in Ethiopia. I can live luxuriously and work there peacefully to aim at that aim of mine, to lift the cultural heritage of Ethiopia, which I did. I came back after a year, set up my studio, and began my work. And this painting of Africa Hall, there was a big competition, OAU, ECA were going to be formed. And so the Italian architect, whose name was Mezzedimi, 
who had taken care of, of this ECA building combined with OAU building to be. He had already given the stained glass work to an Italian artist from Perugia. Fortunately, I knew Italy. I had comrades in Italy. This name didn't ring a bell as a contemporary artist. I mean, like Primo Conti and many others whom I knew were the greatest painters of the day. They were going to pay 300,000 ber, which is almost, I don't know, in, in dollars. But at any rate, it was big money. So I said, if I win this, I have no problem for the rest of my life. So I must work hard and I must enter into a competition. And then when I spoke to the emperor, he said, the work is already given to an Italian artist. The architect was called and he was asking, why did he do that? Because this is an African subject. It is going to be in Ethiopia. Why? So he said, there is no artist capable enough to do a stained glass window. He said, it is a European art. Nothing to do with Africa. He forgot that a stained glass window began in Egypt, in ancient, the pharaonic times. However, the emperor said, are you able to do it if you are given the opportunity? I said, yes, I have studied the stained glass window, mosaic, frescoes. And then he said, all right, it should be done by competition. The architect came with another defense. He said, the ECA is opening in six months. There is no time to do this work and finish the building. Then the emperor again came back to me and he said, are you sure you can do it in six months? I said, I will, Your Majesty. I always remember what you told us. And I said, I am not against Italy today. I have learned and studied there. I have many friends. But I must teach this architect that an Ethiopian can do it. And so I meticulously, every square meter that it had the characteristics of a real stained glass, which is called uh, in the antique style. Every piece of glass is not a painted glass. It is with grains, so that as the sun moves through it, it can give a new life, a new reflection. And. So the Italian architect was told, if nobody in Africa could do it, then this person who has got the work doesn't have to fear of losing because it is in his tradition. So the emperor ordered that every African country has the chance to compete in this competition. But they said it must be done in 30 days. So in any case, I went back to my home. I shut my door. In 12 days, I did it. The subject that was given to the Italian and the thing he did, which we didn't see, was Africa then, he had a little pygmy with a big book in his hand and said, education in Africa. Number two, he said, Africa, now and then, he had a tall uh, Tutsi tribe with a small sword in his hand. He said, defense in Africa. And then the central window, he had all the types of Africans, but the, right in the middle was a sphinx coming out. Well, I'm sure most of you can guess what that means. That the only thing to remember was the Sphinx of Egypt. Otherwise, it was a colony. So to avenge myself, I closed myself in there and I said the first part should be Africa then with the slavery, with the, the devil dancing with the gloomy color of black and red. And then the second part 
Africa now, uh, Africa then and now, when Africa begins to look with the map of Africa, some of the Africans that are already free, they are looking straight at you in the stained glass window. But the others who are still in the colonies, they are hiding themselves. And then this big devilish bird is flying away, symbol of colonialism. And the African is throwing them out. And then the central, uh, the, these two windows are covered with a chain, unbroken chain. In the central part, it is surrounded and the chain is replaced by those countries which were already free. Around it you see the different uh, uh, flags. And in the center, you have this Ethiopian and his wife who is pregnant and a little child holding the torch, the torch of the rising sun, of the new dawn, of the new day. And behind him, are the different African nations which are already free in their national costumes. And then you have one, a knight in armor with the United Nations flag on his chest, which represents that all those who are becoming free and independent have the right to enter the United Nations. And then finally, it, all these things came from about 30 countries. They were shown and mine was declared a winner by se uh, of the 17 judges by the 14 judges. Including this work from Perugia, which he has already done, this artist. And then, uh, you can imagine what happened to me. I was very happy, and then we were called in front of the emperor, and I was declared the winner. It had fulfilled all the qualifications of a stained glass uh, art. Now, the second problem, unexpected problem, was people, ministers, who thought I was already this little boy who is so arrogant, and so much taken notice of without any kind of appointment in the government, was having this name and this kind of thing already beginning. So they went and told the emperor, you see, <laughs> this boy should know who is ruling Ethiopia. Instead, he has put in the center the ordinary Ethiopian family. The man you see there, the woman you see there, and the little boy, they are not the image, the imperial image of the imperial family. So they suggested to him that the face of the central man should be the portrait of the emperor, and the wife should be the empress, and the little boy, the Duke of Harar. Now, as an artist, you can imagine that only will exist as long as the emperor is king. But the day he is removed, and revolutions are everywhere, that painting, that stained glass window was gone. So I was called to change this into that image. Not by the emperor, by his minister of interior. I said, oh my God. How I, how I have forgotten to put the emperor there. I will do it. I will be very happy to do it. So give me time. I knew that the whole thing to see, you have to have the whole image in a stained glass window. And the head only of this uh, peasant boy, uh, man was already one square meter. Until I have finished the work in stained glass window, nobody will see it. Who is who? in that painting. So I continued my work in Ethiopia. Then I came to the south of France. I did it in Saint Etienne, where I was an apprentice for a while in my educational days. And then when it was finished, almost finished, 
the emperor visits South America. And there was a coup in Ethiopia. And then all the French press, when, when I started this work, were talking about it. They said, no, the emperor is gone. What are you going to do with your uh, portrait, with your uh, stained glass? I said, I will continue my work. Politics, I am a juvenile delinquent in politics. I know nothing about politics. So I will continue my work. Continued, the emperor came back. He shot, uh, he hung some of these people. And then when I went back with my stained glass window, I said, I want the whole place closed and the policeman to be there because this Italian may destroy it because his work was not there. <laughs> so immediately, presto, there was a police, nobody, I said, nobody, including the Minister of Public Works. And then just before the opening day, which was in 15 days' time, nobody came to that place. And then on the day, just three days before that the ECA was going to open, the emperor came in the afternoon, and that was the day when the dignitaries, everybody entered, and I explained to the emperor, this was this, that was that, and my hands were already uh, a little bit butchered by the glass, and then he listened so quietly. I explained to him, you know, what it means, this, that, and as the light moves behind from morning to evening, it was like the symphonic music of uh, Beethoven Symphony Number no. 9 with the chorus. This stained glass was talking. After I finished, he said, may God bless your hand. He said, this is priceless, he said, because mind you, I was not paid I just asked the emperor to pay only for the raw glass, but the payment will be done afterwards. But apparently I didn't know it worked negatively <laughs> when I changed, when I didn't change the face of the emperor to the peasant. Anyway, he said that we will never be able to pay for this. He said, may God bless your hand. He left. Believe it or not, to make a long story short, for two years I was not paid. And after two years, I dare not say this to a foreign press because I want to live in Ethiopia and I want to work there. And then Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, invited me. He was so impressed by this window. He said, we want you to do something for our parliament. So I said, you must ask permission from the emperor. The emperor was asked. Then he sent somebody to me and said, haven't you got enough work in Ethiopia that you are going to serve another country? I said, no, but I have not been paid for my work that I have done. And then I said, I have to go to a country where I will be paid. So they set up a committee immediately. And at that time, they said, I was government educated. I had the privilege no other Ethiopians except few have. Therefore, it is expected of me a free contribution to this thing. But I said, you were going to pay the Italian. And they said, well, <laughs> you better keep quiet if you want to work in Ethiopia. Otherwise, make your exit to Paris or London, wherever you want to go. Anyway, thank God. I have the ability to share this with you. I'm going to share with you what I felt at that time. If you have toiled so far with a stained glass window cutting your fingers, and then when the, the hall was opened successfully with all the leaders of Africa at that time, including Senghor, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, and the one of uh, Kenya and so forth and so on. I can't complain to anyone. But the work begin, began to be very famous. Within those couple of years, everybody talked about the Africa Hall stained glass window. Every tourist that came had the ability 
to see it, it was like, not like the, uh, today in America after uh, this bombardment of the towers. We, we had that reflection also in that organization, the restricted uh, tourists and so forth and so on. So my name was built by this. And after this, I did six more important stained glass windows. And one of them, the latest, where I won about a year and a half ago, the Da Vinci diamond by, uh, in Europe. And of course, you will see in most of my works that I felt I would take this time to just give you a glimpse of one artist. Now, I just briefly I want to tell you, in Ethiopia today, we have many artists, foreign educated, who live in a foreign land, and thank God, they work freely. Nobody is oppressing them. That may, makes me feel so happy. And when our second millennium came, the celebration came, there was a great opportunity of winning a lot of works for me. I said, no, I will not compete. I will give the opportunity to the other younger painters who unfortunately, or fortunately, didn't have to go through the horrifying experiences, the anxieties I have had. Let them create freely. Then I said, at the end of the millennium, I shall present three works of mine on which I have been working for a year, which can be used as a public monument in the capital city, in the provinces, also not only for Ethiopia, but for Africa, because all Africans said it is also our millennium. So I also have designed a terrific stained glass window, which can be made into a tapestry, which can be made into a public monument, which can be done in stained glass window. And I said, by the end of the millennium, I shall present mine, which unfortunately you have not seen it anywhere, but in a couple of months you will be able to see. And so the future of art is not so much of a different struggle that I have gone through. People now travel very easily. They can exhibit in Europe. They can live in Europe. And so, uh, I would say I am optimistic for the future of Ethiopian art and as leaders become enlightened for also other African countries. And I just want to uh, thank you for your uh, silent attention. I could say more, but I think I would like to stop here. And if you have any questions, and if we have time for any questions, I will be willing to answer it. But please keep out of politics, because I am going back, <laughs> and I am not really very useful on that subject. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, uh, hopefully, you can speak as loudly as possible. If not, I will try and repeat your question. So if there are any questions. Yes. It is not a difficult question to answer because I have lived through it. But it may be a very difficult thing for the other artists to follow. In art, you have to have a total commitment. No, no other roads. You have to feel convinced that you have a message, not only for one generation, but for many generations to come. To reach that position, as I have said, you have to study and study. And those who live in America, you have this fantastic library. You have the British Museum. You have the Vatican Library. Many galleries, many museums. Then you have the strength if you want to live in Ethiopia and create, there are so many obstacles, have been many obstacles. During the emperor's time, during the dark time, and there are also difficulties in our time. First, 
you have to commit yourself not to be a money worshipper. Have enough. But the mission is so powerful, especially if you are born an Ethiopian. We have a stock of heritage. You have to fight the other battles and bring it to the world and bring it not just a little Ethiopia, but make it part of the world, for the world to appreciate it. Okay, buying, I don't blame Ethiopians for not buying. They have difficulty of their, you know, we are now beginning to be known as the poorest country in Africa, despite the, all the efforts we are making. But that shouldn't touch artists. Artists are with great feelings. For example, when the Derg came and they killed 60 of our leaders, it was a shocking moment. And you know, the French ambassador, the British ambassador, and the Russian ambassador, at different times they came to me. And they said, look, we will organize an exhibition for you take your best works and we will make you fly in within a week. But I said, why? I said, you know, these people are not choosing people. They will come, your turn will come. I said, what is it to you? He said, you know, you Ethiopians always think that uh, ambassadors and so forth and so on only are interested in political things. He said, it's our interest to save chaps like you. You are a world citizen. Then, he said, you come to Paris, you stay. When the thing is calmed down, you will go back to your country. But I said, I can't. I can't fight with my conscience. I have not ruled a country. I was never a minister. I was never an ambassador. For me, as a great inheritor of the Ethiopian heroic people, how many have died in the Battle of Adwa? Before Ethiopia won, they thought this was the end of the day. So they went in, fought until they died. I am an inheritor, a little drop of that blood is within me. I cannot leave Ethiopia at this moment. When am I going to stay in Ethiopia when it is only happy times? Am I going to stay in Ethiopia when everything is fine? I am an artist. A politician may have to do that, or something may have to do that. But as an artist, I am trying to learn how the real Ethiopians are. And this is a moment for me to gather knowledge. What does the Ethiopian do when he is in, in stress? What is he going to do with the idea of fear? I am now 36, I said to the Frenchman particularly, who was very articulate. I am now 36. I have in more than 60 countries, though in private collections, my work. It means that I have done most of my work for my age. But I said, if you take a painter like uh, Raphael, who lived more than 400 years ago, in company of Da Vinci and Michelangelo, he died a natural death at the age of 28. Still today, if you go to Italy anywhere, the work of Raphael is appreciated. Of course, what he could have done if he had lived the age of Michelangelo and Da Vinci? It's the same applies to me. So far, I only know the history of Ethiopians. But I haven't lived it consciously. I told the French, it's a great moment for me, because I will see the natural reaction of the Ethiopian when he faces danger. When he faces danger, where he cannot do anything. Will we have that great Ethiopians that, that are past like Theodros, like Hezana, like Caleb? It is like a taking away the table from which I was eating. I said, I want to know. If I possess a little blood of that within my blood. 
So the French left. I did the same to the English. And then when the Russian came, I said, now we are a communist. You also have fear. Why? He said, you have your work in Pushkin Museum, in Leningrad. This is getting out of our control. Uh, really, we will invite you to go there, make an exhibition, take your important works. We will even buy some of your works. I said, you too? Why? As an artist, I will not be able to step in Ethiopia again. If I have left her in her moment of crisis, I am no more Ethiopian for me. Because I have not ruled this country. I have not made a decision to kill somebody. And I want to see, study my own people. Are we really the people who feel so proud that we have been independent forever? Do I have that spirit in me? And then, you know, they left. And after nine years of the revolutionary government, this ambassador who came to my house, he was appointed ambassador from France to Japan. And when he was going packing to go to Japan, one of his sons told him, Daddy, can we pass through Ethiopia? I want to shake hands with that artist. Apparently the ambassador in the evening had gone and told his wife and his six-year-old child that this Ethiopian, you know, at this moment instead of trying to get out, he is saying, no, he is going to be here. Told them the whole story. Then, after nine years, he telephones to the new ambassador and says, get an appointment for me with this artist. The ambassador calls, he wants this appointment, for the ancient ambassador. I said, now, you see, I am not allowed to travel into a capitalist country. I am not allowed to receive foreign journalists and guests unless I inform the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I don't want to do that. Then, in any case, he comes. When he comes, again he calls, and then we make an arrangement to meet by a place called Gion Hotel. It's a public hotel. When we met there, I said, look, you didn't come for the thing you told me nine years ago. He said, no, no, no. And then it was then he said, you see this sign of mine was six, now he's 14. And he said this to me. So I wanted to give him that opportunity. Well, I said, he wants to shake your hands. I shook my hands with him. And that was the end of that. So there are experiences that the young artist today, it doesn't mean that the problem is over. Life's problem continues. I will not say this is the key of what you should do and that. The buying, I can assure you, it is a hundred times more than in the time I was in Ethiopia. You have tourists to come. You make an exhibition, there are so many galleries. In, in my time, I had to exhibit at the municipality, which was not adapted for uh, showing an exhibition. The light was bad. Then, the second important thing is, I'm now talking to the artists. I'm not talking to the other professions. Art demands a tremendous sacrifice. Even if you are a successful artist, you want to beg to be poor. Because she is such a, a mirage, this art. Unless you approach her with a tremendous uh, decision. And if you, if you have to go, every time you, you face a problem in your work, you have to go and have coffee, you have to go and have hashish, you have to go and live. You are lost. I tell you, you are lost. You have to discipline yourself. It's a tough thing to be an artist. And you have to have such a clear voyance. Then you are free. Then you are powerful. I know in Ethiopia, people come and they want to pay as little as possible for my work. I tell them I have spent months to do this. I can't. But they said, you know, we could get a year.